Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Yaw and I'm a final year PhD student at the UCL Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Welcome to today's Taster lecture all about warning systems. So we'll start with a brief overview of what a warning system typically is and then we'll dive into a few case studies to put those things into context. We'll look at some of the factors that influence how effective warning systems can be in protecting people against oncoming hazards. And we'll also appreciate through that how complex warning systems actually can be. So warning systems are exactly that, they're systems, and they're not just single events, but they're processes. And in order to be successful, they really need to be embedded in the everyday lives of people. And they need to take into account how people live when they're not facing a disaster, in the immediate future at least. So some of the essential components, as I'm sure you can imagine, would be a good data set, we need good data in order to be able to forecast and model and get accurate predictions for what's ahead. Built on that then, on that scientific component, we need a good infrastructure because we need to disseminate that warning. So we need strong communications networks and as many of them as possible, for example, radio, television, internet. And we also need clear messaging so along those infrastructures, we need clear communications and we need to be able to tell people in a way they will understand that scientifically correct, but also widely accessible um, in a language that people can understand and are familiar with what the risks are that they're facing. Now that goes hand in hand with a baseline of risk perception within any given community. If people aren't really aware of what their vulnerabilities are and how a hazard or an approaching risk might affect them, then they're not going to be in a very good position to be able to judge how to respond, irrespective of the advice that they receive. Now imagine you're in a situation facing an oncoming hurricane. What information would you like to know or would you feel you needed to know about it? Considerations around time, path, speed, intensity, and where would you go for your information sources? Who do you trust and who do you find more reliable? If you received an instruction to evacuate, would you follow it? What would make you evacuate? What would make you decide where to evacuate? And what would make you more hesitant, maybe compel you to stay at home rather than moving anywhere? So we can see from just thinking through some of those elements there that actually the decision making process around warning systems can be quite complex. There are a lot of idiosyncratic elements to them, depending on who you are, where you are, who you live with, what hazard or hazards you may be facing. And it's not simply a matter of getting a warning message out there. It's the, the important thing is what people do with that information once they receive it. So in order to explore this a little more deeply, we took three separate case studies. The first was from the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011. The second was from Super Typhoon Yolanda in the Philippines in 2013. And the third from Major Hurricane Maria in Dominica in 2017. Now on the face of it, it may seem as though these three case studies have very little in common. But there are a number of similarities that run through them all that make them good comparative studies. The first one is that they're all island nation states. The second is that there still exists disparities between wealth and inequality in each country. So even though Japan and Dominica are considered developed, relatively wealthy countries, Within those, there are still regions where the socioeconomic status is very different. And thirdly, perhaps most importantly, is that all of these places experience multi-hazards. 
So it's not just windstorm, it's not just earthquake or tsunami, storm surge or volcanoes, but in many cases it's actually a combination of all of them, or if not all of them, many of them. And they experience them with relative regularity, so an annual hurricane or cyclone season, for example, or reasonably regular lower scale earthquakes. In these particular instances, we chose them to study because they represented extreme examples of those hazards that are faced more regularly on a much smaller scale. So with each one of those, there was an element that was unfamiliar. In Japan, the earthquake was strong, with the additional tsunami brought additional complications. In the Philippines, Typhoon Yolanda was accompanied by a strong storm surge or a large wave of water. And that was actually something that a lot of people weren't expecting. In Dominica, the hurricane actually intensified very quickly, very late, and had a slightly varying path, so caught a lot of people off guard. And it was precisely because these events were rarer than are normally experienced, and they were more extreme than is normally experienced, that they made such good case studies for highlighting how important the, all of the elements of a warning system are. And not only that, but how important it is that all of those elements work together. The extremity in these case studies really highlights that when one element of a warning system doesn't work, when it fails or when it fails to connect to the other elements, it really can have catastrophic consequences. So what did we find? Well, to start we found that most respondents did actually receive some form of warning, which is good, but we already know that just the receipt of a warning isn't the be all and end all. It's about the decisions that you then make and the actions that you then take that determine actually how effective it is. Multiple sources of warning were proven critical, as no one source actually reached more than 50% of our respondents. But when sources were combined, for example, a message over the radio and a message over the TV, or even including a mobile network message, they were actually a lot more effective at reaching people. So it shows that redundancy in that sense is needed. And the reason some of those sources of warnings didn't necessarily work was because there were failures in the systems. The infrastructure usually was the point of failure. In Japan, for example, you can see on the top graph, we have AMP, which was a mobile messaging alert system present and in use at the time. Now, there was a software incompatibility at that time, and the messaging system was not always working on the newer smartphones. So unusually, we found that younger people were actually missing some of the messaging and older people and people with older technology were getting more of the warning messages. Now, quite often during an extreme weather event, networks can suffer. So TV networks, radio networks, phone networks are often damaged and destroyed and they, this really hampers communications. You can see in the graph at the bottom, in the blue bars, this actually represents Dominica. And in the top bars, you can see the radio. Now, the radio was by far the principal means of warning, disseminating warning messages ahead of Hurricane Maria in 2017. But the radio networks actually failed when Hurricane Maria was still a Category 2 hurricane, which for most people is actually quite manageable. It's more the sort of strength that they're used to. The radio networks failed at this point and Maria hadn't yet made landfall, but the rapid intensification before Maria arrived meant that when it did arrive, it was actually a category five hurricane, but people weren't alerted to this because their radios were no longer working. So they were caught unawares and suddenly what was a manageable hurricane before was actually very deadly now. The implications of this are, of course, that if people didn't know exactly what they were facing, they were going to fall back on their usual behaviour. If they thought it was like the sort of strength of hurricane that they're used to, they would do, they would behave in response in the way that they normally do, which is usually just to batten down the hatches and ride it out at home. Had people had the full information picture, 
they may have risk assessed the situation slightly differently and they may have evacuated or they may have taken more appropriate safety seeking behaviour. So the point here then is that yes we need redundancy in systems and we need multiple warning sources, we also need to strengthen infrastructure so that continually updated information can reach people at those critical moments, but we also need to consider that people have with previous experience of such hazards will fall back on what they know if they're not told that what they're facing is any different to that usual regular situation. So in addition to things like power failures or local topography which may block signals, we also have to consider how people live their everyday lives and what their daily priorities are. For example, in Japan, many of the residents close to Sendai Airport actually soundproofed their homes so effectively to block out aircraft noise on a daily basis that it also inadvertently blocked out siren warning sounds. So we can't have a widely effective warning system if it's not really embedded in the cultural context in which it's supposed to operate. So we have to look at how people have been living up until that point, how people are going to live through the disaster, and then how people intend to live and what their needs are following when they're reconstructing, when they're facing new hazards, and when they're returning to their everyday lives. One factor that we looked at next was when the warnings were actually received. And we can see from the first graph on the left there that at least in the Philippines and Dominica, most people had a few days to one week's warning before the typhoon and the hurricane actually arrived. This in itself can be a point of contention because too little warning doesn't allow you to either make the strengthening preparations to your home or to gather what you need to gather and to be able to physically move somewhere else, especially if a lot of other people are doing the same thing. Too much time, on the other hand, may not really convey the level of urgency that's needed and may lead people to take too much time or no action at all. Some very subtle age-related differences were found in Japan on the bottom right-hand graph here. And this just leads us to remember that different people will react in different ways in their own time frames. Some people will feel the earth shaking and evacuate immediately before hearing a warning. Other people will very much wait until a warning is heard. Now it stands to reason that where you live will affect your decision making process and whether you decide to move to a shelter or a neighbour or a family member or whether you decide to stay in your own home. In the Philippines, we found that this very much did affect decision making, whether to evacuate to an evacuation centre or to somewhere else considered safe within their locale. On the left, you can see a picture of a very strong looking concrete house that suffered very little damage at all during Typhoon Yolanda. On the right, you can see a more traditionally built house with wood and corrugated iron sheeting on the roof. These structures were extremely vulnerable to the high winds and were almost always completely destroyed, especially if they were within the reach of the storm surge as well. But this raises an important point about warning systems for multi-hazard environments. Had this been an earthquake, for example, and the concrete building may have fared far worse, whereas the wooden structure, flexible and able to flow and move with the movement of the earth, may have actually withstood a lot more shaking. Now this is a really good example of individual risk perception. Knowing how vulnerable your home may be to an approaching hazard means that you have to know the full information picture about the approaching hazard. The key problem and the key failure of the warning system in the Philippines before Typhoon Yolanda arrived was the use of storm surge in the warnings. Now this scientific term may have been accurate at the time, but it wasn't a widely understood term. Our respondents told us that had the warnings used almost any other way of describing a wave of water, they would have understood and they would have changed their behaviour. They would have evacuated because they would have realised the risks that they faced.
This again highlights the importance of a full and complete information picture to be provided by warnings. Many of our residents told us that warnings advised them to move if they were in a particularly dangerous area or if they lived in weak, vulnerable housing. This, of course, relies on quite a high degree of subjectivity and so without a full understanding of the hazard that they faced, it was very difficult to make that decision to either stay or to go. We often think that the decision to evacuate the home is taken by the entire family and the entire family moves together. However, in some situations, this isn't the case. In the Philippines, we found that there was a tendency on occasion to divide the family, with the women and children going ahead to the evacuation centre, usually before the typhoon, and some of the men deciding to stay at home, sometimes with one of the sons. This was primarily to protect the home from looting, from the theft or damage of business assets such as fishing boats or small shops attached to the houses, and also livestock. Livestock can't move with the family to an evacuation centre, so in order to look after and protect cows and pigs, etc., somebody had to stay at home to watch over them. This introduced an interesting level of vulnerability that hasn't always been acknowledged in the past. Suddenly it wasn't necessarily the women and children who were more vulnerable, but it was the men that were staying behind. We heard anecdotal stories of husbands and sons being lost to the typhoon and the storm surge because they'd stayed at home over worries for security. If they survived, they were quite often sheltering in damaged houses which offered very little protection against the elements and any possible follow-on hazard that might arise. Sometimes we found that decision-making was not always taken by everyone in the household and societal, cultural, contextual and even family dynamics could dictate whether people stayed at home or whether they left. Again, a good effective warning system needs to take into account these idiosyncrasies and the fact that people may not always behave the way that a warning would dictate them to. Each context will come with its own considerations, its own advantages and its own challenges. And this needs to be very much embedded into any warning system if it's going to work effectively. Sometimes measures put in place to protect people from hazards can bring about a somewhat false sense of security when hazards are extreme. The seawall in Japan, for example, led a lot of people to believe that they would be safe and protected from the tsunami, not realising that in this instance that wasn't necessarily the case. Warnings are also subject to the challenges around false alarms. In Dominica, for example, only within the two weeks prior to Hurricane Maria's arrival, passed through Hurricane Irma, which was the first Category 5 hurricane of the Atlantic hurricane season that year. Hurricane Irma was widely warned against and people made a lot of preparations anticipating a very severe impact. Irma, however, passed through and Dominica remained relatively unscathed. So when the warnings for Hurricane Maria came along, a lot of people believed it would be a similar situation. We had a number of anecdotal reports stating that people were actually much better prepared for Irma and when it didn't really come to anything on the island, they thought Maria would just be the same story. With this expectation in mind, and a lack of information on Maria's late intensification, a lot of people were caught very unprepared. Now from the charts in this slide, we can see that most of the messaging was advising evacuation to a designated centre. And that seemed to correlate with what people actually did. A lot of people did go to a designated evacuation centre. But you can see that family and friends was also a very, very popular choice. But there are a number of places that people decided to go instead of, instead of an evacuation centre. So we started to wonder why. If we're to be compelled to leave our home ahead of an approaching hazard, and told to go to an evacuation centre, 
What might we find there and how might that influence our decision making? What if we listened to the warning, to the evacuation advice, and went along to the local evacuation centre, only to find a scene like the top left hand picture on this slide? How would that make you feel? Would you like to stay there? But it's not just necessarily for an emergency period, for example a few days, a week or two. Sometimes people are in evacuation centres for much longer periods of time. So what if this living situation turned into a month? What if we were still there two or three months later because we still didn't have any viable home to return to? Then what? Have a few moments thinking around some of the concerns that you would have if this was your evacuation option. Thinking not only a day or two in advance, but what might come after that if everything doesn't go to plan and you can't get home for some time. That top left image may be far from ideal, but what about the bottom right image? What happens if you've been to evacuation centres before and then you've seen the aftermath and this is the state that they're left in? Not all evacuation centres are themselves that well protected, so there's another balancing act at play here. Is it more risky to stay at home or is it more risky to leave home? Thinking about structural integrity personal safety, accessibility, length of stay. Suddenly we see that simply listening to a warning really isn't that simple at all. Thinking back again then to how hazard warning systems are actually systems and processes, we propose that there are a number of foreground and background factors. The foreground factors, as we discussed earlier, are the well-known scientific communication, social and infrastructure elements. Things such as robust communications networks, accurate prediction data, timely information dissemination, and of course a consideration for particularly vulnerable populations. They all affect warnings directly and they all need to work together. A weakness in one is a weakness in the whole. The background factors in the grey text here mimic the foreground factors. They all work in the same domains, but they're not the core components in the same way. They do, however, bear heavily on how people respond to warnings. They're things that build up over time and they're affected by culture, understanding, relationships and previous experience. And like we've seen, they inform and influence decisions quite heavily. They're central to an effective warning system because they represent the everyday factors. They represent what's happening in people's lives at any given moment and however well integrated a warning system is into those considerations will ultimately determine its success in protecting people from hazards in a timely, appropriate and suitable way. We've seen a few of the fundamental elements of warning systems then, and putting them into some different contexts has demonstrated how tricky it can be to tailor warning systems to your populations appropriately. Even within the same country or the same local area, it's very difficult to be able to manage risks for everyone and to be able to make a warning appropriate and suitable for everyone because our lives are just so different and so complicated. So while warnings are connected to the past, the present and the future, they're definitely not linear processes because they're part of a bigger journey that doesn't follow a straight line. Your home and where you live will affect your decision should a hazard arise. It will affect how you respond to a warning message. It will affect where you go. When you get there, say you go to an evacuation centre, your time there will affect where you move back two in the reconstruction phase. So where you build your home, how long it takes you to build your home, 
and what sort of quality your home will be, what sort of construction methods and materials you'll use. It will affect when your kids go back to school. Some schools are used as evacuation centres, so they have that has a direct impact on education. It will affect your livelihood, how soon you can return to economic activity, which in then will have an effect on your home and your security. And your home then, depending on how long it takes to get back to a livable standard that you're satisfied with, that offers you the security you would like, or that you're able to achieve, then affects how you respond to future warnings. Should another hazard come along, should more shocks arrive, that then has a knock-on effect on how you decide what to do next. We've seen that warning systems are essentially there to assist the decision-making process through amalgamating with individual and collective risk perception. We've also seen, however, how breakdowns in communications, infrastructure, and other support systems can ultimately lead to an imbalance so that an incorrect, incomplete, unclear information picture is conveyed. In those situations, people will inevitably fall back on experience and their own knowledge. And as we've seen in the case studies, that can often have very severe consequences. Even if we can get the messaging spot on, the decision-making process is always going to be tricky because there are so many human factors involved. And that's really why warnings are very much within the social realm. I hope this small insight into warning systems has been interesting and enjoyable. And I hope that it's been valuable to be able to see some warning systems actually placed into context through the case studies. I hope too that some of the thinking time around warning systems um, for other people, but also for yourselves has been insightful to be able to consider what factors would be most important to you, where you would get your information from and, and really what would affect your decision making. If you'd like some more information on the case studies themselves, we actually have a couple of papers where you can deep dive a little bit more into the intricacies of those studies. So please feel free to check those out.